several weeks ago, I was reading an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, because yes, I'm that kind of a nerd. <laughs> it's actually a fascinating uh, journal. It's a, as you can well imagine, it's geared towards higher education, administrators, staff, faculty, um, and um, reading the articles recently, there's been a lot of struggle in our in our higher education. Um, I, I could say there's been a lot of struggle in and then everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> this one happens to focus on higher education. So I was reading about the challenges our educators and our students have been struggling with through these last couple of years of pandemic disruption. And having a daughter, I have a daughter who is now 20. Um, she graduated in 2020, graduated high school in 2020. Um, amidst that disruption, opted not to go to college that following fall because her initial plan was to go to Portland, Oregon, <laughs> and she just didn't feel that, that was going to work. Um, and anyway, she's she's bumped along. She's she's doing fine, and she's making good choices and, and good questions. But I get how some of these students coming into our universities are struggling because the path that we've told them, the path that many of us have followed, isn't as straight and clear as it has been in the past. So anyway, in this article, there was a, a college counselor um, who shared with uh, what struck me as one of the most heartbreaking comments, one of the most heartbreaking statements. She noted that one of the most common questions, or really laments, that she hears from those students is this. I don't know how to belong. I don't know how to belong. Now, I know many of us older than college age folks, right, might kind of roll our eyes at that lament. Come on, you don't know how to belong? Those of us for whom belonging has never really been an issue, we all know how to belong. You just find a group that interests you, show up, and then boom, belonging. <laughs> and we can even acknowledge that for many of us, that some of us whose lives are such that boom, belonging <laughs> has never really been true. Some of us here today and out in the world have to fight our way into belonging. Some of us are still fighting our way in now, taking spiritual and emotional risk to cross even the threshold of this space on this day. And it occurs to me that in innumerable ways, we humans are always constantly negotiating our belonging, our belonging to our families, our belonging to our friends, to our work, to our church, to our communities, to wherever we find ourselves amongst other people with some commonality that resonates in our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our souls. Still, whether you're on the boom belonging kind of person or the kind of person that's still fighting my way into belonging, the how of belonging really isn't in question. So it isn't only heartbreaking to hear the young college students say, I do not know how to belong. It is confounding. How can you not know? Show up, right? Find your way in if you have to. Claim your belonging. Maybe it isn't easy, but it can't really be unknown, right? Is it even possible forget how to belong. But the, quish, the question should give us pause. 
it has for me at least. It's been probably two months since I read that. And that phrase, I don't know how to belong, has been rolling through my head ever since. And I wonder if there isn't something missing, some unspoken or even unknown piece of searching inside those students. Which brought me to Bothius. Bothius. You all remember Bothius, right? You know, come on, you remember Anicus, Manilus, Severinius, Bothius? That sixth century Roman senator, historian, and philosopher? No? Yeah, me neither. Until three months ago, I don't think I'd ever heard of this guy. Even though it turns out he wrote a best-selling book. Like the kind of book that would have topped the New York Times bestseller list for a couple of hundred years. And at the time, had there at the time been a New York Times bestseller list, or a New York Times, or a New York or in Old York, or Amsterdam, never mind. I'm sorry, where was I? Bothius. So, in the odd case, and I, I know you're, it's brilliant people in this room, and, and you already all know this story, but in, in the odd case, for one or two of us that hadn't heard this very famous book that I'd never heard of, called The Consolation of Philosophy, I'll give you the, the, the briefest of notes on this. So the Consolation of Philosophy, this is both of the book, the Consolation of Philosophy is a musical. Okay, well, not really. But it is written, I, I love this part, it was written in this apparently popular style way back in the Middle Ages, where there's a section of prose that's interrupted by a section of meter or poetry. And it goes back and forth. And reading the Consolation is a feels a little bit like going to see Oklahoma or watching the movie Grease or High School Musical, right? Where you're just going along, learning the story, and then suddenly, and for no apparent reason, somebody starts singing, and everyone else joins in. And the consolation is kind of like that. And it's a bit jarring at first, right? But then you get used to it, and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, it completely makes sense that they start singing about the Surrey with the fringe on top of this. Anyway, neither here nor there. The consolation is more accurately placed in the genre of prison literature, which I didn't really think of as a genre until you realize that from, you know, Socrates forward, we're always writing things from prison. So that prison literature, it's, it's, it's apparently when we find ourselves imprisoned, we also find ourselves with maybe the time and inclination to write about it. And there's something about, I think there is something about having one's freedom taken from them or constrained from them that inspires this kind of literary outpouring. And I think even, you know, uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, right? So prison literature. So the basic gist, why, why is Bothius in prison? So the basic gist of the consolation is that Bothius is in prison and is going to be executed pretty soon. And the reasons for his imprisonment and his impending death have to do with a paranoid emperor and some documents, which is really tangential to the point of the story, but also oddly contemporary. Bothius is likely, very likely, innocent of the charges that have been brought against him, but he's been found guilty and he's going to be executed because, well, history, right? Anyway, he, Bothius, is pretty upset about this turn of events, as I think most of us would be, unjustly accused and um, sentenced to death. He had been a respected Roman senator. He had accumulated wealth and some power and certainly some prestige, right? 
all of those markers of a presumably successful slash happy person way back in the early 500s. Or, I guess, today. Right? Yeah. In, re in reading both this, I thought, oh, turns out that our living generations didn't invent, didn't invent the idea that wealth, power, or fame were equivalent to or even lead to happiness. Sorry. We've been arguing that. Humans have been doing, saying that to themselves for longer than we can all imagine. In any case, Bothius is despondent that it could all be taken from him so suddenly and so unjustly. So he's in his prison cell writing bad, self-pitying, angsty poetry. Because he thinks that, I, I don't know, maybe that will console him. And it kind of reminded me of, of my generation back in the late 1980s, listening to the albums of the Smiths or the Cure, seeking solace of our angst in someone else's angst. So while wallowing in his self-pity and scrawling out Morrissey lyrics from the radio or whatever akin to that in the 5th or in the 6th century, suddenly, suddenly Bothius is visited by the manifestation of philosophy. And philosophy comes to him as this beautiful woman. He spends several pages describing the beauty of philosophy as she ascends or descends to him, kind of shows up at the foot of his bed. And she's in this resplendent dress. And her dress, by the way, this is kind of interesting. Her dress, by the way, has been torn. They're like shreds of it at the, at, the, at the hem, at the bottom, right? And it turns out the dress had been torn by men seeking truth, grasping, but only ending up with a little shred of it and walking away thinking they have the whole deal. I love that part. It feels so real that we all sort of think we have the truth when we just have this little piece. The whole book could have ended right there. It would have been gold and much shorter. Anyway, <laughs> philosophy begins to talk to our prisoner, Bothius, to try and diagnose his sorrow and his angst. And we all think, well, at least I thought, his sorrow and angst was pretty obvious. He's in prison for something he didn't do, and he's going to get killed for it. I'd be pretty upset. But philosophy goes through a, quite a bit of, uh, quite honestly, rather annoying Socratic back, back and forth. You know, the Socratic method, asking the question that they already know the answer to, and you have to just basically agree with them. Um, anyway, after many, many... Um, questions and, and back and forth, she comes to the diagnosis. And she tells him that his problem isn't that he has lost all his power, his renown, his wealth. That's not the problem. That's not why he's sad. That's not why his heart is breaking. That is not why he's so full of angst for this world. Nor is the issue the utter injustice of his situation. Turns out that's not the problem either. Nor is the problem even that he's about to lose his life, she says. That didn't have anything to do with it. The problem, both use this problem, that philosophy, lady philosophy, finally tells him is that he has forgotten who he is. Bothius has forgotten who he is. Bothius has forgotten what the Reverend Dr. Julia Corbett Hamer calls, and I love this line, the sovereign mystery of our selfhood. The sovereign mystery of our selfhood. He has forgotten. He has forgotten this first belonging the one that undergirds and grounds all the rest, that belonging to oneself.
So perhaps then this is the deeper hidden question behind those students' laments about not knowing how to belong. That's maybe the thing they say, but deep, more deeply within them, it isn't that they don't know how to belong with and to others. It's that they, like Bothius, have forgotten their first belonging to themselves. And that resonates deeply with me. It resonates deeply because as I listen to people wrestling with their lives, recalibrating their lives after so much disruption, after and through this bewildering disruption of a global pandemic, or maybe it's the bewildering disruption of global climate change, or the bewildering disruptions of our democracies, or whatever the bewildering disruption of the thing that you presumed was stable, reliable, able to be counted on. For Bothius, his stability was in his status, his wealth, his position, but of course, those are all ephemeral. Those all can be taken away as they were for him. So no matter the instigating bewilderment, I think most everyone I know has at one time or another forgotten that their first belonging is to themselves. And that self-belonging is the core to belonging to our families. It's the core to belonging to our friends, our work, our church, our communities, our bridge club, our golf clubs, our book clubs, our teams. The thing is, though, friends, is that we are smart, well-trained people. We have a lifetime of experience in our cultures that have taught us that belonging, that happiness, that who we are is all grounded in externalities. We've been inculcated into responding to the question, who are you, with either the work we do, I'm a minister, or the relationships we hold, I'm a father. Or the ideologies we ascribe to, I'm an American. Minister, father, American, those are all externalities. And it's not that those things aren't true. Or that we're not asserting ourselves, negotiating ourselves into those belongings. The problem for us and for both of us is that these are almost all external to that sovereign mystery of our selfhood. And it's these externalities. These externalities are so contingent. They are fragile. And, and, and we think they're stable. We think... We can hold on to them and count on them, but they are so fragile and they can be taken away from us justly or not. Which is why I think that philosophy is telling both of us that he has forgotten who he is because when we know, because when we know who we are, when I know who I am, when I am connected to that first belonging, that cannot be taken away can't be taken away from me we cannot lose it and perhaps we hear this in these familiar admonitions Aeschylus or Socrates or Plato's invocation of know thyself right or Polonius's famous line in Hamlet to thine own self be true. Or Emerson and his motto, trust thyself. These assertions from brilliant minds that tell us that our self-knowledge is key to living. As if self-knowledge was that simple. Yeah? Even the venerable Ben Franklin, 
observe the tension embedded in the admonition to know thyself. He wrote, I love this, he wrote, there are three things extremely hard, steel, a diamond, and to know oneself. No wonder we find it easier to look to the externalities for our belonging. In an essay, it's actually a long series of essays called The Technologies of Self, Technologies of the Self. The French philosopher Michel Foucault drew an interesting and important distinction. I had not known this. So the ancient Greeks had two phrases related to this self-knowledge business. There's the one you're probably most familiar with is know thyself, know thyself, which in part had to do with humility. Partly the Greeks were worried that you thought yourself a god, and you need to dial it back a bit, right? Of knowing one's place in the cosmos, of knowing that we weren't God. No, Thyself, though, also demanded a kind of intellectual self-examination. Or if you're me, intellectual self-cross-examination. Sometimes feels like an interrogation tied down and being yelled at. But Foucault notes there was an earlier phrase before they started saying, know thyself, predate it was nothi saton, Pardon my really terrible Greek. <laughs> but Nothi Saton was know thyself. But there was another one, and this is going to be even worse Greek, ready? I can't even do it. Epimel esthai sato. That translates to something more like take care of yourself. Be conscious of yourself. Take care of who you are. And that actually predated. That was the admonition before they came to know thyself. Take care of yourself. And I think the distinction is important. That's two different things. Take care of myself and know myself. And I think we have to do both. That deep belonging, that belonging to self, that knowledge of self, that, that care of self, all has to happen together. So in these moments of lostness, in the moments of bewilderment, in the moments, as, as Reverend Rod Richards says in his poem, when the only piece of belonging I can feel is the longing, we must both know ourselves and take care of ourselves. Be careful with ourselves. Be curious about ourselves. Be honest with ourselves. Be forgiving of ourselves. Be forgiving of ourselves. Be grounded in ourselves. Be loving ourselves. These ideas, these practices, being loving of ourselves, being grounded in ourselves, forgiving ourselves, being curious of ourselves, being honest with ourselves. Once we have gained that skill, once we have practiced these things, these are the things that cannot be taken away from us. They become who we are inextricable from our sovereign selfhood. Belonging first to ourselves, we become authors of our belonging to and with others. We become authors. This is what Bothius does. 
he becomes the author. Knowing himself, he becomes the author. He becomes authentic. We become authentic. Friends, our great invitation here at the UU Society of Mill Creek is that we invite each other to be known, befriend, to belong, to become fully and vibrantly alive because we believe there is a power in community that emerges from belonging to one another. And that invitation that invitation can really only be truly accepted when we have, at long last, remembered our first belonging. And in so doing, we show up as authentically ourselves, ready now to belong. Amen, my friends. And I love you. And may we live this blessing.